Hello and welcome to the podcast. You're here with Physique Development. Today we're going to dive in headfirst into a myth busting series. The first episode of this series is going to be all about why strength training isn't only for men, right? So if you scour the internet, you're going to find plenty of articles discussing the pros and cons of strength training for women. Some are good. Some share helpful insights and tips while others aren't so good. And I guess that's how articles go. But that said, the language around the topic seems a bit tired, outdated, and repetitive, which I'm hoping today we sort of surmount some of those things and add a little bit more of an interesting uh, dynamic to the conversation. So I kind of want to start out by saying, you know, blanket statements aren't quite fair regardless of sex or gender. And, you know, saying like, well, all men don't have the same goals, right? So to blanket statement, all men into one, you know, misconception, I, I think is unfair. And that the same goes for women, right? And I think that's important to say here in the beginning, because we're going to talk about some, some widely spread misconceptions and widely spread more or less myths that are out there that, you know, I, I think we more broadly speak to. Um, but, you know, if you're listening to this, and you're like, I've never thought that. I, I don't think that. Why are you saying that about me? Uh, one, relax. And uh, we're, not, we're not attacking you. Um, we're just kind of, we're wanting to educate a little bit more on and, and add to the conversation on this topic of um, women and strength training and, and the importance of strength training in really everyone's life who walks the earth, right? And um, I know, Sue, you, you just had a recent episode with Charlotte. So how did that go? That was great. If you guys haven't listened to it, it came out on June 27th, and I absolutely loved recording this podcast with Charlotte. If you have listened to it or you've been following along, then you probably know that Charlotte has been my client for over two years. And so the dynamic that we have as far as being a coach and client and then also being boss and employee is really cool, especially being women within fitness. And so it was a transformative conversation and I, we both got goosebumps during it, just talking about how great our experiences are, our experiences with clients are with getting in the gym and going and lifting weights and what it's all taught us. So if you listen to this one and you're like, wow, I learned a lot, and then you want to hear two women in fitness talk more about this topic, I highly recommend going to that episode. And just for you guys to know in general, we do release episodes every single Monday, not only on every podcast platform that you can listen to, but also on YouTube. We have the video if you like to interact and see the people talk. I know that's how I prefer to listen to podcasts. And then we also post on our YouTube two other times during the week. So we have videos that go out on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the YouTube. So I did want to mention that, but it was an extremely great conversation. And I'm so excited to hear your guys' thoughts and feedback on it. Yeah. And, and I think today, um, one, if you are listening to this episode or and you want to get involved with this, this podcast in general, um, go on YouTube and just start start to interact in the comment section. That's one thing that we're, we're wanting to get going a little bit more um, and to have you guys, you know, interact with the comment section. And I think this episode is a great start to that because we're going to be talking about here first barriers of entry. Um, and I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I see as far as women entering the gym or, or women in my own life that have you know, talk to me about entering the gym or, or past clients or, you know, current clients even is this barrier of entry. You know, there's a lot of friction to getting into the gym. There could be intimidation, right? There's this, um, there could be a, a lack of self-confidence, which isn't only women driven. I, I want to make that mm -hmm. very clear too, that it goes across, you know, all genders. And I, you know, there's, there's times I've even, <laughs> depending on the gym, I, I'm probably intimidated at some point. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to kind of, int I wanted to start with barriers of entry and, you know, Sue, because you are the, the only woman in this conversation <laughs> here today, I wanted to kind of start with you and have you kind of go into maybe how you got started in, into the gym. You know, it doesn't have to be a long story, but it, it just how you got started into the gym, kind of what those influences were. Was it a gym partner? Um, what did that look like? And, and was there a big barrier of entry for you? 
Yeah. So luckily, when I first was in middle school, high school, and I was doing different sports, we did have weight training for women. Now, at that time, I wasn't very well versed in what we were doing. Also, during gym in high school, we did have like a weight section. So as far as like within the we had pickleball for one section, then weights, you know, it all went on. Um, And so I did get some experience there going into it. And I had kind of ventured into the gym myself. But luckily, it was a gym that had very low intimidation because it was a much older crowd. So that was something that was very easy for me to kind of scoot into because it was intimidating being in those uh, gyms with the other athletes and these guys lifting and squatting and me being like, oh my gosh, I can't even lift my own body weight. And then going into a gym that was a much older crowd allowed me to kind of go in there and just do what I needed to do. And when I got to college, it was something, and I'm sure a lot of women can relate to this, but the gym was actually set up in two levels. And the upper level was a lot of cardio. And it was kind of like a pit down to the lifting section. And it was something well known that women go straight upstairs and they're doing cardio and they're watching the men lift the weights down on the floor. And it was something that I did start off doing that. And it's something that when it comes to a gym, first, if you are a female and you do love cardio, don't let that deter you of, oh, now I can't be on cardio machines because then I'm furthering this agenda. You can still be on cardio machines. And when I go to a new gym, I often go to a cardio machine and kind of take that time to kind of scour the gym, look around and build out what I need to do, especially if it's a gym I've never been to before. But it was something that I kind of eased in with just going and doing cardio like every other girl that was there. And then I started to see a girl at my college lifting and she was posting on Instagram. And I emailed her, shot her an email and was like, hey, I'd really love to lift with you. Like, I promise I won't be in your way. I'll just kind of like tag along with you. And so I ended up going to the gym with her. And it was really beneficial to have that gym partner there as well as she worked at the gym. So she had a lot of friends around the gym. And then we, she also had her boyfriend at the gym. So when I was there, I felt very safe because I already had kind of a circle around me of, okay, this person that works at the gym, this person that's with me, and I'm not going to feel alone. And then she also is having her boyfriend here. He has friends. So it felt really great to start my true gym journey in that situation because I did have this lower barrier because I had these people and because I reached out first to begin with. I have a question about finding that person's email. (laughs) Did you guess the email or did you actually find the email? I actually found it because she did just start like a fitness Instagram. And so she had it in like her bio and was like, email me for a workout plan or email me for this. And I was like, be my friend, help me. (laughs) Yeah, I, um, I've, I've guessed many of emails in my, in my day. Um, I assume I get them all right and people just ghost me and that's probably not true, but (laughs) like if you go to a college, you can, you know, you can Mm -hmm. guess a lot of emails based off of kind of the, the way that the, the emails are structured, your email is structured. Um, anyway, so I I was just curious, um, that's, that's, that's an awesome barrier. Um, that's an awesome entry into the gym for you. And I think that's a big, you know, it's going to be a part of today's discussion essentially is, you know, if there is a a barrier of entry for you, it does help to find a friend, a training partner, a group of people, right? And this is kind of where I think group fitness classes come into play. And we'll kind of discuss the the pros and cons of those classes, um, but probably hopefully mainly the pros. Uh, today in, in terms of getting people into the uh, fitness environment to kind of have them catch that iron bug that we all caught early on uh, in our own training careers. Um, so if you are kind of intimidated right now listening to get in there, try to find someone who who's in there or maybe find a, a small group of people who are in there that you can either wave at or find their email uh, like Sue did and, <laughs> and shoot, them an, shoot them an email. Yeah. I think it's something important, like you said, that gym intimidation isn't just for females. And if you have listened to Alex's Fitness Journey podcast, he talks about how he was a smaller guy in the gym. So what what did that look like for you still getting is, into the st- gym? Still am. Um, <laughs> in his mind. 
Uh, it was, it was a little bit different because Austin and I had the opportunity to work with Josh Wildeman, uh, through high school and, and junior high. And, but in junior high, I guess is when I was, uh, probably the most intimidated because the group of friends that I had, we were, we were lifting for football. I was very weak in the realm of like, I don't know if I weighed a hundred pounds until I got to my freshman year of high school type situation. Like, I don't, I don't remember honestly. And, um, so within that, I was very nervous because Josh would have us sign off on our last lift. And so I would forge Josh's signature all the time on those papers. And he and I have joked about that since um, with still being fortunate to have a, a relationship with him. And Josh, I'm sure you're listening because you tell me you listen to all of these. And uh, Josh jo on Instagram now too. So I know Josh got an Instagram like th two or three days ago. So that is awesome. Um, and so I had that experience and then that kind of gave me a foundation of understanding how to work out, like the exercises and those different things. And then I had a friend uh, named Blake Himmelgarn who kind of like carried me through. And then uh, I started to work out with Austin. And so that was kind of like, I found friends along the way that just like helped to keep me accountable and keep me consistent, which was a, a game changer for me. Cause I wouldn't, I loved it, but I was probably a little too fearful to do it by myself or, or, or too cautious to do it by myself. And so having that friend to consistently go with, it was something that you got to hang out with one of your friends, but also get the, the workout done and those things. And it gave you something to, uh, you know, chat about and learn about and, and all those different things. So I found it to be something where, uh, um, super beneficial to have the friend, I think is the, the biggest thing. And now that there's so much access within YouTube, like um, you can watch our YouTube channel and find yourself in a position where you have a lot of education around these different exercises that may seem very daunting. And you have uh, well-educated individuals who have been in the trenches for a long time walking you through these exercises to give you uh, certainty that you're doing it right. And you can watch, you can take video of yourself and then watch the execution videos and put those things side by side and see, okay, does it look similar? Do I feel like I'm getting the right thing? And uh, there are individuals that will reach out to us via email and be like, hey, I know I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I've been watching your videos. I love your YouTube. Can you look at this? And so like, that's something that until it gets too overbearing, there will be a time in, in our careers that we will not be able to have the mm -hmm. access to do that kind of thing. But at this point, I am I am able to, Austin's able to, Sue's able to when we, when we have time to. So anytime that you guys have questions on that kind of stuff, we're more than willing to help. But um, back to the scheduled programming. <laughs> <laughs> it is summertime. And with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think too, um, do, do you guys notice another follow-up question to that, I guess. Do you guys think it's probably more intimidating nowadays with people, uh, with people's phones and, and big headphones that they have on and kind of this I'm here and please ignore me mentality relative to I, I do feel like we were still when we all started into the gym there was there wasn't quite the the craze of okay I'm going to be on my phone I'm going to film every set I have these giant noise canceling headphones which I'm just explaining myself into the gym here <laughs> um but you know there, there wasn't necessarily that culture or environment yet you know and and so do you guys feel that it would be, and it's hard to kind of say because we aren't starting today, but do you feel it could be harder today because of that versus when there was a little bit more of a uh, more extroverted, I guess, environment at the gym where people kind of had conversation between sets? What do you guys think about that? I would say that when we were getting started, it was the wired Apple headphones or you were, you had it made and you had the Beats wireless headphones, like one of the very first ones of those. And so it was an easier time to communicate, I think, and, and approach someone because it wasn't as um, abundantly clear that they did not want you to talk to them type situation. And I th also think that people are a little bit more friendly. Um, and also at that time, it was very foreign to pull out a tripod and be like, look at this, I'm going to film myself. Whereas now if someone pulls out a tripod and a camera, it's like, yeah, they're just filming something for social media. Whereas when Austin and I started the YouTube channel, we were made fun of very quickly um, for having tripods out and wearing- uh, Ruthlessly. <laughs> Ruthlessly. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, by individuals here. who were our age, individuals who were significantly older than us, you name it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's one of those situations where like for both of us, we had to have had each other because if one of us was doing that by ourselves, we probably would have stopped. Like the making fun of would have made the one person probably stop doing it. At least I know for myself. Yeah, I think a big part of it does depend on your gym environment as a whole, because if I look at my fitness journey and I look at the different gyms I've been to throughout that time frame, I could feel that way at different gyms at different points in my journey, just based on how welcoming it was or how not welcoming it was, because there is a gym that we trained at in Kentucky and it was not welcoming at all. And that was one of the first times I felt like the biggest gym intimidation that I ever had because no one, people would like steal machines. They were not very polite. They were in your way. They um, like would kind of like make fun of someone for filming or something like that, where there's gyms that I go to now, where if a girl sees another girl filming, they'll be like, oh, can I help you film that? Or you want me to get a picture of that? Or do you need help with this? So I think part of it is that social media becoming more acceptable and more accessible. And so people understand why people are filming and there's more information out there as to why it's beneficial to film. And then people are making careers off of it as well. But then there's that other side of just certain gym environments aren't as friendly or aren't as welcoming in general. So I think it does depend. I don't think it's like then versus now. I think it's more of the environment that the gym has created as a whole. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a, very, that's a really good point. And let's dive into our first misconception here, or let's say myth, um, which is, you know, strength training makes women bulkier, right? And I, I use that language. I ch chose my words there extremely carefully because I want to highlight that. And I, I, I wanted to open up, um, I wanted to open up the floor to you. So strength training, making women bulkier when they actually want to be leaner and more toned, right? That's like kind of the the main driver of, of a myth or a misconception. And Sue, I wanted to open up with you because I, I know that this is not what's, at least from my understanding, <laughs> not what's in your no. head as far as like <laughs> what I'm all. doing in the gym, right? <laughs> so I wanted to open up the floor to you because I think when I, you know, in the beginning, when I talked about these blanket statements, you know, when, because so as a, you know, as a man, and I think Alex, you know, Alex can second this too, you know, men get blanket statement all the time with certain behaviors or certain uh things that they may desire or want or, or strive for and it's like as a man i can tell you like i don't strive for those same things that this other dude is you know and like that's not a, that's not a fair thing to say for all men you know and but for some reason and probably male driven and honestly i've, I've heard females you know talk about this too and, and really blanket statement all women in this conversation which i think is completely unfair but we very we're, we're we're very quick to make these these blanket statements right so we're very quick to say like oh well women only care about like we have to break down this wall continuously every single day of strength training makes women bulkier and they just want to be more toned and blah 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 and that obviously applies for some right there's some listening that may that's st may still be ringing around in your head um but for a lot of people and i, I think a lot i would say that our clientele and and audience speak for that themselves when it's like no i'm here to get jacked dude mm -hmm. like i want to get jacked <laughs> and i want to get strong right and so sue i wanted to open up the floor to you and just you know what do you think of this statement and the way that this this axiom is is typically used or this this misconception is this rooted in fear or just misunderstanding I think it's rooted in excessive misunderstanding, as well as the fact that people have different wants in life, just what you vocalize. So I even posted a picture on Twitter the other day. I loved the way that I looked. I felt so good. And some rando commented back and was like, uh, women don't look good with muscle. You need more fat or more curves on you. And it's something that a lot of women are told that by men. And that's very difficult when you're pursuing something or going after it. And somebody, whether it's someone you know or somebody random on the internet, is going to tell you you look better a different way. And that's something where that's where that fear comes from. Because as a woman, I will go ahead and say that we are told and um, – 
We are guided to look and act and talk a certain way, and we are told to be small as well. And it is something that when you are getting told all these things you should be from other people, and you don't have this self-confidence or this self-awareness or a self-belief, it's really hard to break out of that because you're just getting everything from everyone else, and you don't even know what you want because you don't know yourself enough, and you're being told, no, don't have muscle, do have muscle, have more fat on your body, have less fat on your body. And it's so confusing as a woman to be navigating through that and then truly deciding what you want your body to look like. For me, these past few years is the most me I've ever felt. And it's the most that I followed what I personally want and what I want out of my physique instead of what somebody else is telling me. Where past Sue, a couple of years ago, if somebody would have commented, you look better with less muscle or you should have more fat on your body, I would be like, oh crap, I probably do. I should go ahead and do that. Even if it was just one comment, it's something that we've been programmed from a young age of first, you need to fit a certain desire from someone. And second, you also need to look a certain way. So you need to figure that out and you need to fit whatever society is telling you. And so that's where some of that fear comes in, but it's also this misunderstanding of what's actually going to happen when you do go in and live. And I often get so frustrated, but I try to take a step back and realize like people just don't know where someone the other day had said something of, oh, I guess if I want to lose weight, I should just cut out X, Y, and Z. And I was like, no, you just need to look at your portion sizes and do this, this, and this because it was specific for this person that I knew. And they were like, well, I've done this of just cutting everything out in the past and I lost weight. And it was something where I just wanted to like wring their neck and be like, no, I'm telling you right now that's not the case, but there's so much misinformation about diet and training. And what I'll say as far as getting bulky in the gym, and this is the thing that I always try to drive home to women, I have been very meticulously tracking my macros, tracking my workouts, training, being consistent with every single variable for over six years and putting in the work, lifting very heavy for someone my size, and I'm still not bulky. (laughs) Like if you think that you're going to go in the gym and pick up a dumbbell and all of a sudden just these muscles pop up, people work for tens of like 10, 20 years to get that look. And if you're looking at women in regards to um, like within the bodybuilding world, you also have to take into consideration first, that's their whole world. That's not going to be your whole world if you're just getting into the gym. And there are other variables involved within those women. And so being able to take that into consideration instead of putting that blanket statement of like, well, this woman lifts and she's really bulky when there could be other circumstances at hand. And the great thing about lifting and if you want to call it bodybuilding or training, is you get to choose for the most part how your body ends up looking and how you change things. Throughout the past six years, Alex and I have had a very, like, um, we've had a conversation going of, hey, what do you want your physique to look like or what is the end goal here? And we have that conversation. We adjust training and nutrition to fit that. And then I go after that. It's not that I'm over here looking like she-hulk and have like these huge muscles in places I don't want because I'm able to have someone who's going to guide me in the direction that I need to and acquire the results that I want. So as you can tell, I can get really passionate (laughs) and frustrated about this just because I want women to know you can lift and you don't have to just lift lightweight and lots of reps to look a certain way. And not that I want to say, oh, it worked for me and use that as my only result. And good thing it's not my only result. It worked for the thousands of clients that we have at Physique development. If you want any social proof, look at our physique development Instagram page, go to our website, go to any of our Instagram pages. You see the transformations and all of those women are lifting weights and they're seeing these changes that they want to see. And then they're gaining power as Charlotte and I talked about in our podcast as well. So I feel very passionate about the way that that's phrased. I feel like there is a lot of misunderstanding, but there's also fear wrapped into that as well. And it's a lot of layers for a a female to kind of unwrap and pull back and figure out for herself what she wants. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to open it up first to kind of, I I knew that that fire was there and I was like, (laughs) I got to get this out of her on the onset of this conversation. Um, Because that really sets the tone, I think, for the, the, the next half hour or so 
Um, so the next, you know, <clears throat> I guess, I guess what actually, my next question here is like, what actually starts to trend or what actually starts to happen when women commit to progressing their muscle and strength, right? And, you know, Alex, I, I guess you can, you can give our, our first answer here because, you know, you work, you've worked with a, uh, a lot Lots of, of women lot over of the women, last, yeah. Um, over the last few years. So what, you know, what actually, so based off of what women think are going to happen, what we kind of just discussed, what actually starts to happen with women when they start to train? Yeah, I, I think that um, I think that a lot of self confidence is rooted in strength training. Um, I, I think that it was a big piece of, of how I found my own self confidence, um, and I find that within a lot of the women that we work with, that I work with in the, that I've worked with in the past, that I work with currently, find a, a lot of self confidence in one keeping the promise to themselves that they're going to show up every day and train as hard as they can, but also prove to themselves that they are significantly stronger than what they they previously thought. I I can't even probably count the number of individuals that have come to me and they send their initial training clips of them performing a leg press or a back squat or a hip thrust or a deadlift. And it is painfully too easy. Like they are just going through the motions and it's like, okay, I did eight repetitions, but by golly, I could have done 20 at that weight if I just kept going and really challenged myself. And so getting them, getting them to a place where they're increasing the load and proving to themselves like, oh man, I am way stronger than I thought. And then they continue to to build off of that and, and build self-confidence and, and build uh, strength, not only just from a muscular perspective, but again, I think it builds mental fortitude and those different things. So there's, there's so much outside of resistance training that comes with it. And I understand that some individuals love resistance training. Some individuals don't, and they understand it's good for them, so they continue to go. And so um, it's one of those things that I think there's so much value uh, that you can apply to your entire life just from simply getting in the gym and really challenging yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. And what about the composition changes that your clients have seen? Um, are they mostly happy and they never thought that they could look like this? Or do they feel like they're this bulky woman that they don't love anymore and they hate the way that they look? Um, they, they certainly are not bulky and, and hate the way they look. They, they love how they look. They, they feel that self-confidence. They see the hard work that they've put in, um, within oftentimes their glutes and their delts and their hamstrings and all these improvements. And I think that more often than not, individuals come to us in a place where they're not happy with how they look and they feel as though that maybe they have too much quad tissue or they're, they're doing so many things that are just not working for them. And we put them into a protocol that is going to be more facilitated for them and educate on that whole process so they have an understanding past the time of working with us. And I think that that's a very valuable thing that we do and uh, setting people up for success, not only in the time of working with us, but the time past that. And I think that the, the confidence part of things is also understanding how it all works. And so by giving them the opportunity opportunity of like, hey, this is why we're doing the training this way. This is why we're structuring your nutrition the way that we are with this training and so on and so forth is a really helpful tool because it's a crummy place to be when you leave a coach and it's like, all right, well, that was awesome. But, uh, I have no idea how to use that. And the reality is, is that you can take those protocols and the food that was there and run it forever. And the likelihood of it being the same level of success three years down the road is probably pretty slim. And so you have to have the tools and understanding of how to adjust these things to continue to see that progress. And I think that that's a really important piece for all the clients. Yeah. And then hormonally, I mean, you don't have to go into a deep dive, but just like the benefits of going and lifting and what that does for their hormonal health as a female, because a lot of people just think like lifting testosterone male, but what does that look like for females? Um, I, I mean, it's going to be uh, helpful. I think that we look at so many different factors from a, a hormonal function. When we look at testosterone, we look at estradiol, we look at progesterone, we look at DHEA, we look at all the functionality of the thyroid. There's a lot of things that go on and all of these things within moderation and, and not excess of resistance training are going to be uh, benefiting in a, in a positive manner. And, and so I think that, um, individuals who maybe experience some thyroid issues, some individuals who may be experiencing some hormonal downregulation or things of that nature would benefit from the resistance training in those different aspects. And I think that um, getting them like on the flip side of this, let's say an individual comes to us and this is common where they have a, a uh, estrogen dominant or estrogen 
estrogen dominant position. And so with that being the case, they come and, and they individuals in that scenario may be performing orange theory and multiple sessions of that, and then also going in and, and running and then also going and, and doing resistance training. And so getting them to a, a volume allocation that's more fit for the calories that they have in place and also their hormonal function at that time gets them into a much better place. All of a sudden they're uh, sleeping a little bit better. Now we're getting into a greater balance and not in such an estrogen estrogenic dominant place. I can't talk today. Um, so th that is something that uh, is is going to be helpful for sure. Yeah. And just because I did mention testosterone, I mean, testosterone isn't just a male hormone. It's not something that only males need. It's not only helpful for your like drive in the gym and your recovery in the gym, but also your drive and recovery in life and your libido, as well as a multitude of other factors. So it is something that has personally helped me and my hormones. And that's why I'm also passionate of that because it has just allowed me to be in better health and have a better understanding of my body and be able to move my body in a better way and live in my skin in a more comfortable way. That was a great, great dialogue, guys. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, next, next up here, we're going to talk more about, um, and I'm going to pose this to Sue, uh, cardio is better for women who want to tone up and lose weight. Is this, is this true? And how much does this fire you up? And if it does fire you up, let her rip. <laughs> it is true to a certain degree. Uh, I always say it depends. Everyone's favorite answer. But it truly is something that if you are, let's take a few different situations here. If you are excessively overweight, this is something that just doing some cardio, like going on a walk. So we also need to define what cardio is. Cardio doesn't always mean I'm doing hit, going for a run or doing the Stairmaster. It can be going for a walk. If you are excessively overweight, going for a walk, or it might be of like a walk is too difficult on your joints, of doing like a light bike ride might be the best level of entry. So when we're talking about barrier of entry, we also need to look at how capable someone is and how that fits into their life. So if it is something that you either have an injury, or again, you have more weight to lose, that would be the greatest entry for you is, hey, I'm just going to start moving my body a little bit more. So that is a great option if you are wanting to lose weight. But it is something that when we're looking at cardio and weight training and being in a deficit and all those factors, one thing that we do need to split the difference on is there's a difference between losing weight and losing fat. So if you've gone through a dieting phase and then you end it and you're like, I kind of just look skinny fat or I lost weight, but I don't have the look that I wanted to have it's very, very likely because you don't have enough muscle on your physique. And it is something that weight training can also burn calories. But as you have more muscle on your physique, you can have more food in place because it is working and your body is going through those calories. But it's also something that as you are able to get that toned look, which toned literally is just going to mean you have more muscle and less fat. So if you think that by doing no weight training, you're going to get that toned look, that's going to be very difficult to achieve if you have no muscle tone on your body, because that toned look is coming from muscle tone. So you have to have some muscle on your body to have that look. And with that, cardio is a great option to add in to lose fat or to lose weight. But you are going to want to pair it with something, and especially depending on your specific circumstance. Again, if you're brand new to the gym and it feels so intimidating to go in there and start lifting, then just start with going in and walking on the treadmill. Start meeting people at the gym. Start getting comfortable with the space that you're in. Maybe after you do your cardio, then you start doing some stretches or you go over in a corner where, where you're doing your stretches and you just have some dumbbells and you have our YouTube pulled up or our Instagram pulled up and you're just going through a few things by yourself and you have this corner. And then maybe you do bre breach out and start going over to the machines and everything. So it is something that cardio, I wouldn't say is quote, better for women who want to tone up and lose weight, but it is something that is a beneficial tool and it is a tool that you want to be able to use in different circumstances. But when it comes to toning, you want to have muscle tone to be able to do that. And one thing I will add with the cardio piece is that 
it's going to be probably more beneficial for you to track your overall NEAT and tracking your steps from a day-to-day standpoint. Because if you're just the only activity you're going out and doing that day is like 30 minutes on the treadmill and you're like, well, I added in this cardio and nothing's happening. And it's like, well, what are you doing the rest of the day? Because uh, for instance, and this is kind of a a more extreme case, if you will, but for a contest prep athlete where um, calories are getting low, their body fat is getting low and they have a little bit of higher cardio and then they find themselves in a scenario where outside of their resistance training, outside of their cardio uh, that's being prescribed, they're literally not doing anything, not moving at all, sitting on the couch and whining about how hungry they are or uh, that they have so much cardio or what have you. And so oftentimes the problem is that they're just not doing anything throughout the day. You're going to burn more calories throughout your day and having more things being involved with your NEAT rather than just the simple uh prescribed cardio for that day that's 30 minutes or 40 minutes, uh, you need to look at it from a full day picture and understand that there's a lot of value and many other hours throughout your day that are outside of the hour and a half or hour that you're spending at the gym. Yeah. And one other question I'll just ask is, do you have any clients that just do cardio and see the results that they want? Um, I, no. So I, you know, everyone knows me. I am going to talk in the most um, full picture scope here. There are individuals who I'm working on blood work and really improving some very in-depth pieces to their blood work, that there are phases that we're just doing cardio and focusing on cardiovascular health to get them into better position, male or female. There's been phases for individuals that are like that, depending on how poor the blood work comes back. So there are phases, and I, I want to give that small, small caveat. No, I think that's a great caveat to make because it is something of saying, like, it's it's not that we ever want to demonize if you're only doing cardio. There are times times that that's the best. And like I talked about, if you are very overweight or you haven't ever been in the gym, it's probably not the best to start moving your body in the gym. It's just best to start moving your body. So I think that that's really, really helpful because I don't want someone listening to this and be like, well, they told me to lift weights, but my hormones are in a poor spot. I need to go lift weights. No, you need to do what's best for you. And that's what you need to be able to take from this podcast of all of the episodes is we want to give you context. We want to give you information and we want you to be able to apply that to your life instead of just giving you directions because directions are easy to follow then it's very hard to apply and to see change past that so we want to give you information so that you can apply that and use that as guidance as you move forward those are great points by you both um and i I think context is everything right and there there's a lot of conversation around You know, and I preparing for today's episode, I listened to, you know, a few other podcasts. I listened to a few other conversations around this topic. And, you know, oftentimes, and I I kind of alluded to it in the beginning, oftentimes there, even with people that I I respect and and really like uh, as educators and, and general people in general, you know, still kind of go down this can become very sort of dogmatic and, and a very opinionated, which having an opinion isn't wrong, but I think the way that you share that opinion when you have a a high level of influence is important, right? Because, you know, you may say something uh, as as satire, or you may say something ironically, or you may say something where, you you know, you, you know, you're being sarcastic and, you know, your high level colleagues know you're being sarcastic or satirical, but those listening don't, always understand that irony or or sarcasm. And so they're going to take that as like, oh, well, now this, now this gets more complicated for no reason because, okay, I was moving, I was moving my body. I got into the gym a couple times a week. Maybe I touched a weight, maybe I didn't, but I was, I was fighting gravity. I was fighting resistance, uh, through, through walking, maybe on an incline or through a recumbent bike or through a rowing, rowing machine or a stair climber or something. And I was, I was starting, I was starting to create that momentum towards something, right? Which, which I think in a, in a large way, what, you know, group fitness classes start out to be for people, you know, and we'll get to those here, here in a minute. But, um, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to say ultimately that, you know, if we, if we look at the broads and I'll, I'll talk about this a little later in terms of what we know about the, the, you know, the science backed benefits of strength training, but in terms of looking at like a single modality, right? A sing, one single thing 
that can give us the most benefit in terms of lowering risk of disease, uh, function into older life across a lifespan, maintaining strength, uh, maintaining body composition, you name it, it's going to be and come down to strength training. It's gonna come down to some form of resistance training, right? And resistance training is very broad, right? It doesn't have to be this like, well, I do four sets of 10, bodybuilding, bro, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's like resistance training is very broad. And you can ask a lot of our clients, I mean, you can ask all of our clients if you want, uh, if they're open to it, that their all their programs look very different. You know, a lot of people's look similar or maybe adjacent to one another or because they have similar goals. But other, you know, other folks I work with, you know, I have a, I've had a client uh, who, you know, 65 year old woman. I don't train. I don't have her train the same way that, you know, a, a classic physique competitor would train or or some young buck who wants to just look jacked in his 20s. Like that, that's not he's not training the same. He's not using resistance training, the tool of resistance training the same as this this older individual right which we're, we're having different goals there um, but that doesn't discount the fact that strength training or resistance training is the main modality the main driver of those those positive very very positive adaptations and on the on the the whole reason i brought that up the whole on the topic of cardio when if i were to look you know and i did so much research to write my book and Within that, you know, I, I I read so many so many studies and so many research reviews and, and whatever else, and time and time again, no matter who or what author was talking about it or what researcher was talking about it, always returned back to yes, strength training is very important. Probably is the best single modality in terms of time spent versus reward we get from it, right? But the best overall holistic approach is going to involve some sort of resistance training or exercise and an aerobic-based cardio exercise. That's gonna be the best holistically for you. That's gonna be the best in terms of overall health, right? If we had to choose one, I always go with strength training if the person's open to it because it has the biggest bang for your buck, which we, you know, if, we, if you only have an hour to do something productive towards your health each day or five days a week or four days a week or three days a week, choose the thing that's gonna get you the most benefit, right? But if you have more time in your life or you have, you know, you you have the the driver motivation to try different things, some form of resistance training and some form of aerobic training in combination with one another is hands down going to be the best in terms of building overall health. Um, do you guys have anything to add to that before we move on? Yeah, I'm just glad that you mentioned it because when I first started lifting, it was very common for people just to hate on cardio if you were lifting weights. It was cardio is hardio. Like, I hate cardio. There was shirts that had all these slogans about how cardio was the worst. And I, like, encompassed that and was just kind of like, ugh, cardio. I shouldn't do cardio. I'm all about lift lifting weights because I found this passion. I was like, oh, forget cardio. I'm over it. And then as I started to evolve in my fitness journey and evolve in life, there's this beautiful thing where you're able to change your mind on things and learn more facts and harness things in a different way. Where before the cardio that I was doing was cardio I didn't enjoy. And I got into walking slash I've always been into walking. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love cardio. And this has benefited my life in so many ways. So I've really switched the way that I talk about cardio and not that I ever want to demonize it, but I do want to bring light to the power that you can have not only within your physique and your headspace and your confidence, but also your health from lifting. So I love shedding light on both of them. I just don't want, want women or anyone to go down the path that, okay, I have to do cardio if I want to be toned or only do cardio if I want to be toned. I want you to do both. You're going to have a very full life doing both and you're going to feel better. Even Alex recently realized that he wasn't getting a ton of steps in a day and we both decided to hold each other accountable. We're both going to at least go on one outside walk a day and we have a step count that we want to both hit. We both feel so much better going and doing that. And so definitely don't need to demonize cardio. But it is something that you do want to learn a little bit more about how they can cohesively live together and not looking one tracked 
Ron tracked mine. I, I will say that uh, I am a, a data nerd. And so I get my bloods quarterly. I don't have any like specific reason as to why I do that <laughs> outside of just being the nerd that I am. And so within that, there's a very distinct difference in terms of some of the, the blood panels in which I know that I've been just resistance training and not keeping up with my steps and, and not just taking care of myself to the upteenth degree of like the, the biofeedback markers that I know are important. And there's a big difference when I am uh, doing all those things, like across all the, the the markers that I would be paying attention to, everything is enhanced in a positive manner. And it's not just solely dependent on the resistance training. It's really dependent on the other factors around the resistance training that really enhance or improve my, my blood panels as a whole. Yeah. And there's nothing else to add to that. I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to add anything. To that. You guys, that was great. If you're listening to this right now and you're like, dang, this sounds freaking great. I would love to be able to add muscle to my frame, but I need help doing it. Go ahead and look at the link in the description box or in the show notes. And we'd love to hop on a call with you and be the last coach that you'll ever need. Um, let's move on to group fitness classes because I've I've teased it a few times in today's episode and, and Sue mentioned it as well. And I, I know that there's going to be a lot of listeners who really really enjoy these these classes right and I, i'm gonna say i'm not saying we're not gonna say any cons about these potentially i don't know what we're gonna say actually but i want to start out with with some positives right and i'm gonna pose a question more or less alluding to a positive uh, and i just want to see kind of where you you guys take it we can we can start with sue here um so you know there's a there's a there's a there's a love for hating group fitness classes like Orange Theory, like F45, like CrossFit, all of these things that bring so much positive benefit to so many people and make so many people so happy. Um, and we have, I'd say, I say we collectively because I I'm fortunately and unfortunately grouped in with the totality of health professionals that are out there. We all are. Um, again, like all things, summer, great and world changing. Some are great and do the thing they need to do for their community. And some are awful. And that's, that's just fine. <laughs> the reality you of know, life. that's just a part that's of the in game. Every right? industry. <laughs> that's in every industry across the board. That's across all human, uh, across all humankind. But within my question here, um, you know, as there is a lot of hate towards these classes, what are your opinions on people using these classes as a catalyst or as a starting point in their journey and my second question to that is do you think it can help someone choose the aspects of of, of a resistance type of exercise that they actually love and that they can glom onto after they kind of run their course through a group fitness class yeah I think group fitness is great because it does allow that space for you to have to go in and know that you're going to have a positive experience for the most part. I mean, all of these ones listed like Orange Theory, F45, there's like Shred Hit, Barry's Boot Camp, Burn, there's a million of them. They all do a pretty good job of making sure people feel included and that there's not negativity. Not to say that, again, across the board, that there's never been a negative class at one of these places. But their structure of their business is to create fitness that can be fun and they can hold each other accountable. That's why they have these different point system. That's why they have things on the board. They have the coaches walking around and motivating you. They have loud music on. They want it to be a welcoming environment. And I think it's phenomenal for that, for someone who doesn't know where to start with fitness. And now you get to go with a friend or show up and make friends and you can go alone. And that's great because you're not really talking to someone throughout it until after the class. So you can go alone and be able to push yourself, meet new people and learn things and not even focus on what you're doing because it's just being told to you what to do and you're following along a plan and you just get to get in there and get it done. So I think it is phenomenal for that reason. Where I see things kind of fall off is when people misuse it, but that happens in everything. You can also misuse strength training. You can misuse counting macros. You can misuse cardio. You can misuse anything in life. So it does come down to just how you 
utilize it. And it's something that I'm very careful with the way that I speak. While I only write training for people who want to do resistance training and are going to the gym and doing a bodybuilding type split, that doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. Is that the way that I'm staying in my scope and the way that I program? Yes, but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate or see the benefit of things like group um, group fitness, of CrossFit, of um, like any kind of functional training or sports training or Pilates or yoga. I see the benefits in all of those. And the thing that I always drive home to my clients and then just on social media, on these platforms as a whole, is move in a way that serves you. If you don't love weight training, that's completely fine. Maybe you just do one full body session a week and then you go to one of these classes and then you go to a yoga class. I would love that for you. But again, it comes from this overuse or this misuse where people and this is the benefit of them if they want to make it so accountable for you of you go to class. But a lot of these group fitness, if you miss a class, you get texts from people saying like, why aren't you in class or skip in another day where that can be really positive as someone trying to get into their fitness journey and trying to stay accountable. But it can also be negative as someone is trying to figure out what health means to them. And then they're getting berated by these other people because they're not doing what it means to them. So I think that there are a lot of pros and the cons come from how you use it as it does with most things in life of how you are going to integrate these into your life because I have clients that do these classes I had a client that was doing training with me and she was really enjoying it seeing great results but she was having a hard time getting to the gym and she was like these classes are easier for me to go to it's motivating once I sign up it's a really great environment and I said great stop doing what we're doing and we'll go ahead and transition to you doing that. Now, I know anyone listening might be like, why the crap did you tell her that? And it's because I care about what happens to the client and what best suits the client as a whole. If it is going to be, she can train with me, but she's unmotivated and she has a hard time getting in the gym and she's not enjoying herself versus going to these fitness classes three to five times a week. And we have a plan around her nutrition and rest and all that. And she enjoys the training. She feels pushed and like she can go to it and be consistent with it, then all the merrier reason to do it. So I've definitely also changed my opinion on those of being like, all of those suck, to now being like, it can fit into someone's routine and it can be really positive. It again, depends on how you use it. My qualms with it really reside in all things kind of fitness related because the the big thing within Orange uh, Orange Theory and F45 are going to be the lack of understanding from a nutritional standpoint. So the individuals who are going are not fueling themselves properly going into the session. They're not fueling themselves after the session. And then they're celebrating the aspect of like, I feel terrible. My legs feel like cement blocks. See you tomorrow. And it's like, that's not the goal. And so those are my, my two big qualms. I guess the other, other one would be the aspect of the individuals who are in the class, not adequately having the knowledge of how to perform the movements and they're being timed on the movements that are being performed and having to hit a specific number or they're trying to get a max number in a set amount of time where the individual doesn't even really know how to do whatever that movement may be a squat or, or whatever that is and so those are the things that are problematic in my eyes at least um, I think that if they have better understanding of nutrition and that comes down to the guidance from the individuals who are leading the classes and uh, teaching them and, and talking about nutrition in a way that is going to be um, positive and not being like, better stay, go home and get on your meal plan. Don't veer from your meal plan. That thousand calorie meal plan I gave you, don't veer from that. It's like, I think that a lot of this comes down to the things that are around the training, the frequency in which they're doing it, where they may run into a situation where they're going like four times a week. They go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and they're not recovering from any of those sessions. They just continue to beat themselves up and see just inflammation uh, accrue and their scale readings are not going up. They're just getting puffed puffier and puffier. They're not sleeping well. They're not paying attention to the biofeedback markers because they don't know to. Um, and then they find themselves in a situation where they're not losing body fat. They're not having success. They're in a lot of pain. They could have caused an injury. Things of that nature are, are going to transpire. So, But I also think that that could happen with resistance training. That can happen with a lack of understanding of, of resistance training going in there and following uh, their favorite influencers' protocols that they're on a really 
they're saying they're on a really low calorie diet and doing this very volume centric training, a lot of hit based stuff. So it, those things can happen within all aspects. I think that the biggest thing that we are, are driving home within our podcast, within our YouTube, within all the ways that uh, we communicate with you guys is that education is the root of it all. And, and the more educated that we can be, the more empowered we're going to be. And so that's going to be like, if you have the, the education, all these modes of fitness are going to work much easier. It's time consuming and it's a long game, but you're going to have such a greater time with us- utilizing the group fitness or, or resistance training or, or whatever topic we're talking about. Yeah, I think those are phenomenal points. And I know that one thing that I didn't mention is I know Orange Theory specifically, and I'm only mentioning that just because I've been to the most Orange Theory classes, but they are very calorie driven as far as how many calories did you burn. And I think that does further the mentality of a lot of people that calories are bad and you want to always burn calories or like I can now eat those calories because I've burned it or had such a high burn rate. And then when clients come to us after they've done that, they get hyper fixated on I'm not burning as many calories during my lifting. And then they stress themselves out from that aspect. Um, So that definitely does pop up. I've had I've had both sides of the coin where I've had the opportunity to work with some incredible coaches who work for Orange Theory. Um, I know some of you are listening right now. I love you. You do a great job of the the work that you do within your work. Um, But I've also had the flip side of it where individuals are coming to me with very poor recovery, all the things that I outlined earlier. So I see both sides of it. But again, that's going to apply to any realm of of fitness that there's going to be. Yeah. And as we mentioned comments before, I'm going to be in the comments for the first um, hour or so after this specific podcast drops on YouTube. So if you're listening to it on a podcast platform, you can pop over to YouTube, ask a question or leave your thoughts on any of these topics. And we'll probably rotate between the three of us for this series as a whole um, of who's going to be in there. But I know I'll be in there for the first hour or so after this is um, released. And I'll check back on those comments just so we can create conversation and we can provide more education or just more conversation. Yeah, that was great. Do you guys think, so moving on to the second part of that um, in the aspects, I think this is going to be a really positive and this is going to be our last, our last major point before um, I just wow you guys with how great strength training is for your health. And then we'll wrap up today. Um, I can't leave without talking about some form of research. So it's, it's hard for me to, to not mentioned something but um to the second part of that question uh one thing that i've noticed uh is a lot of clients have come to us in general and and to me in general um or at least the people i'm talking to from something right in their past it something got them into this they found an aspect of that thing they loved or had interest or curiosity in pursuing more and then they pursued it, right? And for a lot of people that come to us, that is, you know, the, the the people who kind of catch the iron bug, if you will. Like, okay, I picked up my first piece of iron today. I touched my first barbell today at F45, or my I touched my first kettlebell or dumbbell, you know, in this group fitness class. And I, I, I found myself throughout the class, you know, if they reflect and, you know, I've had these conversations with people and I've been to F45 class, I've been to these group fitness classes myself. Right, I've experienced these in real time, and I, I watch people. Obviously, um, I love people watching, and I, I watch people, with, especially within a fitness context. Not to judge, we all judge, but like not to judge you, <laughs> but just observe and and see. Like, man, are you struggling with this? Are you actually? I can tell you haven't performed this enough, but like, it does seem to help that there's someone on the TV in front of you, teach sort of like showing you how it should look that almost instantly improved their form enough to where it was like, okay, I feel better about them doing that for 12 reps, um, right? But there's aspects of the the group fitness uh, class and th- this goes across into um, cross, I group, I, I group CrossFit classes into group fitness classes because it is a group doing fitness things. Um, so there's aspects of these these classes and these these initial starters for people that show them that, look, there is a lot of ways to do exercise and do fitness uh, that involve resistance. Which aspect of these do you find the most enjoyable for yourself that you wanna do the most consistently over time? And for a lot of people that walk into 
uh, group fitness classes, like let's say like Orange Theory or F45, is like I, the cardio is okay. I definitely understand it's important, but I really enjoyed when we when we used weights. I really enjoyed that part. And it's like ah, awesome. And that's probably why you're here talking to us is that you know we help people with that aspect of their fitness, right? We help people with the strain training aspect, the resistance training, the weights aspect of their fitness. We help people with other things too, but we really specialize in that part of it. And, you know, for let's say CrossFit folks, uh, they're con they, they either go into more of like a bodybuilding or, or strength training, resistance training, the gym focus, or they really get into, you know, maybe a subculture of the gym, which is powerlifting or Olympic lifting, right? Because they're like, well, I didn't necessarily enjoy all the burpees and rowing, but I really did enjoy, I really did enjoy the aspects of, of the Olympic lifting or the, the heavy lifting of that group fitness uh, class, right? And so that's one part that, that I wanted to really pull out because there's really nothing to add to what these guys said because they, they touched on it really well is if there is a barrier of entry for you to go to the gym and you are thinking to yourself, well, I, I think my, you know, my girlfriends go here uh, to this class and, you know, I've been reading everywhere that these classes aren't the greatest, blah, blah, blah. There's pros and cons, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, so if that's the thing that's going to sort of lower that barrier of entry for you, if that's the thing that's going to get you in there, go take it, take the invitation, go with your girlfriends, go with a group and just start to put one, one foot in front of the other and start to make that step towards building momentum for yourself. And then just start, be self-aware, start to pay attention to what aspects of those classes that you really enjoy and what aspect of those classes that you don't enjoy as much, right? Um, and we're gonna mainly focus on the things that you enjoy out of those. And we're gonna pursue those uh, in more detail and with more intention and, and with more of a plan to get you to where you wanna go in terms of your goals and, and the, uh, the, the sites that you have set on, on a certain look for yourself or a certain way you feel or a certain confidence that you can have. Um, anything you guys wanna add to that before I, before I move on and wow these people with some, some statistics? <laughs> I don't think, I mean, yeah, I think the biggest thing is like, just going back to getting movement in general. Like if you, if you have something that's going to, um, push you and keep you more accountable to getting the movement and getting momentum, because just like everything else in life, it's going to be so momentum driven. If you can build that momentum and get yourself to progressively get better and build your understanding and build that confidence to get into the gym or whatever that thing is, I think that I would, I would push you towards doing that for sure. All right. So I wanted to end today's episode essentially with, um, you know, in the beginning of the episode, I essentially talked about, uh, you know, I think it's important for every human that walks the earth to do some form of resistance, strength based training, right? Again, that doesn't have to be your body. It doesn't have to be a bodybuilding split, but that's just more generally resistance based strength training, right? Which, which goes across, um, a very wide continuum of things. Uh, I think every person that, that walks the earth can benefit and will benefit from it. And I want to just kind of highlight some of the things that it does help with. Um, if you're like on the fence of, well, is this really worth my time? Uh, and, and my answer quickly here is yes. And as I mentioned earlier, a well-rounded approach alongside building in strength-based training and aerobic training all into one plan. And more holistically, if you do enjoy Pilates or yoga, what a triple threat combination of a way to improve your health and fitness and just feel confident and empowered in your life and feel strong and, and stable. So, all right, I'll just hop into these because I'm doing what I do. So improving overall health, that's the most general one, right? Lowering disease risk like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes and other cardiometabolic disorders. Strength training also helps build skeletal muscle tissue. Uh, it helps retain skeletal muscle tissue. We know those things to be true. And it reduces risk of sarcopenia, right? And osteoporosis and dynopenia, right? Which loss of, of muscle and loss of strength, right? That happens um, and, and just overall loss of bone density. It helps mitigate those and actually helps rebuild and regenerate those things uh, across the lifespan. And, and I talk a lot about 
I usually end a lot of these things with across a lifespan, right? Because as we all are getting older here, um, <laughs> we all realize that like, okay, we're not all in our teens and, and early 20s anymore. And it's like, okay, especially me here in this conversation. It's like, okay, <laughs> I do have some aches and pains. And I do see what starts to happen if I take too long of a hiatus from the gym or paying attention to my health, I start to really feel like crap. And my body hurts, my joints ache more. I feel more off balance, I feel less strong, I feel less, less resilient physically. Um, and that obviously, we, as we all see our parents age and our grandparents age, you can start to see, man, what a benefit it would be if, if these folks would have strength, had some sort of resistance training or holistic health approach or exercise approach in their life throughout their lifetime. Because you see, I mean, again, like I, I can see, you know, my own grandparents and, and I can see, um, you know, other folks' grandparents. And it's, it's you know, there is, a, there, is a, there is a contrast to folks who have stayed really active and have been in an environment where that's been accessible to them and they've pursued it versus others who haven't or haven't had the opportunity or haven't been in an environment where it's as accessible for them, right? So I talk a lot about these things across a lifespan. Um, strength training helps improve muscular strength and endurance, improves cognitive function and memory and concentration, which I think is something that isn't talked about quite enough, is the mental health and the brain health benefits of strength training. Strength training could positively impact the development of Alzheimer's disease, which is very near and dear to my heart as I have a lot of family members um, who have had that and have died from, from Alzheimer's related or dementia related illnesses. Um, so I, I'm doing everything in my power to, to fight against that. And, and strength training and resistance training is one of those things alongside, you know, sleeping well and, and paying attention to my nutrition and trying to relax uh, in life. Um, it helps lower risk of the severity of depression and anxiety. That was one that I, I dug up uh, when I was uh, writing science of strength training was I pulled up, there was some uh, meta-analysis uh, and, and systematic reviews from uh, psychology and psychiatry journals that went pretty extensively into lowering the risk of severity of, of your depression and anxiety. Um, even for pregnant folks, um, peripartum uh, anxiety and postpartum depression, uh, they found that it lowered that with uh, individuals who were strength training. Right, so I know we we work with a lot of uh, peripartum and especially postpartum individuals within physique development. So that is a is a huge benefit to strength training as a whole. And again, overall, my last one here is is strength training is is an effective standalone exercise modality for improving health and well being across a lifespan. Right, and more so when used in conjunction with other activities like aerobically based exercise. Right. And if you are an individual that you're wondering, how do I best spend my time? You know, I only have an hour three times a week because I have a million kids, um, two, but it seems like a million because they're obnoxious. <laughs> or um, I just have a million responsibilities. I'm, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I have multiple jobs, you know, and, and, you're trying to figure out what is the single best modality, what is the single best bang for my buck as far as my health, my well being, mental health, brain health, and improving the way that I look and feel. It's, it's going to be some form of resistance strength training. And if you have an opportunity to increase your activity, increase your steps, or maybe do something aerobically based in your life, that's a bonus, right? And all of these are tools that should be used in conjunction with one another as time permits. In your in your life and across your life right we all we all lean on different tools at different times um, we all lean on different uh, interests and curiosities at different times across our life and i think one thing that i want to get across in this podcast episode and i think we've done it really well across across the episode is that there isn't one single way that you should be doing anything right there's 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 a set there's a toolbox of tools that we can use and, and levers that we can pull that can help us move closer and closer to the goals that you may have, right? Some of those goals may involve more cardio than resistance training. Some of those goals will involve more resistance training than cardio, 
you know, X, Y, and Z, the list can go on and on. Um, but I, I want to, I want to make it clear that here of seek development, we are not dogmatic in that thinking. We are not black and white in that thinking. And I think it's very important that if you are inspired or motivated to, to do something, um, we're, we're behind you on that. And we just want to be here to help educate you on the best way to go about it and to build self-efficacy within you and build self-confidence within you. And as long as we're doing that, then we're doing our jobs as coaches and as a brand. So I'll let you guys wrap this episode up. If you have anything else to say, uh, I'm just going to count me out here. <laughs> <laughs> just consider that myth busted. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>